good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Billy Hamilton Stent, and I'm the MD of Loud House Research. I think it's always good to know a little bit about your presenter before we start, and Faye's introduction was very appropriate with these one small thing she's missed out um, that I need to share with you. That is that um, on Friday of last week, for um, um, reasons that I'll, I'll, I'll keep away from the forum, I had to have two teeth removed, my front two teeth. And um, as a result of that, I'm now... <laughs> as a result of that, I'm now wearing dentures. <laughs> Um, so dentures and public speaking, especially five-day-old dentures, aren't um, a great combination. So if I feel like I'm grasping for words or dry of mouth, it's because I'm carrying a lot of plastic in my jaw rather than um, necessarily losing my thread, or at least that's what I would like you to think. So um, I'm here today to take you through some research, which was commissioned... Um, by HRO today to uh, address the, the key themes of the, of the event, really, which are uh, data and analysis and, uh, and partnerships. Um, the point of the research is that you have, a, you have a, uh, um, an executive summary of the data in front of you. I'd ask you maybe not to scrutinize it too much as we go through, um, because all of, the, all of the good bits are going to be up here. Um, but also, the point of the research is, 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 is to inform you but it's, it's also there to create a discussion and, and a debate. These events are, are, are about you know, gathering information up. There were some really, I thought, some really good presentations this morning in, in this room uh, presenting some, some data and insights um, against the theme of HR, evidence-based HR and analytics, which we'll, we'll probably come back to with this. Um, but also it's about understanding how you know, other people in your industry are trying to solve problems, issues that they have, real world um, kind of you know, day-to-day work that, they may be doing that, you know, through, through, through talking through, you can, you can learn from and maybe answer some of your own problems. So part of this session is about sharing some of that. So, you know, there'll be some questions to you and hopefully you, you'll be happy to contribute some, you know, some experiences, some examples. If you have any questions about the data, of course, you can, you can, you can ask as we go along. But that's really the, the, the thrust of the presentation and, 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 and the thrust of the next kind of 45 minutes or so. Just so that um, you know the, the sample for this data, samples are very important when you're in research. So this is a representative sample of large organisations, HR decision makers, and also HR service providers. The data we're talking about today is actually the decision maker, HR leader uh, responses. There are, there are other data from the service provider, so people providing services into, into uh, the HR environment that, that you can look at in the report. Um, but this is essentially your peers. So this is the information, and this is the, the opinion and sentiment of... Of, of, of people like you. Um, and I think it's always interesting to understand you know, what, what, your, what your peers think about various issues in, in the market today and, and in, your, in your industry or, or your business function. Um, what I can guarantee is that all of this information will resonate with some of you and that some of this information will resonate with all of you. But I can be absolutely assured that not all of it will resonate with all of you. Um, that is the beauty, the blessing, and the curse of averages. Um, but the main thing about it is to, you know, for it to provoke, uh, provoke a discussion and provoke a response and hopefully get some good discussion going. So these are the three things that we, we, we looked at. And, and, and the, the, the banner of, of, the, of the event um, over the last, you know, yesterday and, and, and today and tomorrow is, you know, working towards a, a world-class workforce. And I guess we have to ask the question, is this, are, we, are we looking at a solution here for, the, for a world-class workforce? It, it's basically when we try to create excellence or increase performance or improve the productivity of, of, of the, um, the assets in our organisation that, that are people, um, it, is it governed by these three things? I think some of the conversation from this morning, um, just to show hands who was in here this morning, so who, who was in the session this morning? About half? Okay. A little over half, okay. So, um, dealt very heavily on analytics um, and how people use technology to uh, inform business decisions. We're going to come back to some of that as well. Um, I think it's something you can, you know, um, it's, it's a very rich subject. Um, and I think we had two quite contrasting views. And for the people who weren't in the room, one was about evidence-based HR that was probably a little bit away from analytics, dashboards, and technology, and more about gathering together lots and lots of information in a very practical way to inform decisions. Um, and, and the second presentation was a little more about the, uh, from Deloitte, was a little more about dashboards and, um, you know, best practice steps to achieve um, analytics greatness, shall we say. But they, they represent kind of two sides of the story. And as I say, hopefully some of that conversation will come up again as we go through some of the data. So here's a, just a, a scene-setting piece of information for you. 
74% of people in the sample expect growth in the next 12 months, which is very encouraging, um, uh, especially when, uh, and if we read, you know, the, the general kind of macro media and the, the general uh, industrial trends um, with regards to growth of, of recent months, it seems that specifically in the UK, uh, and I should just qualify that the sample is pan-European, um, that there is an appetite for growth um, uh, in, in the commercial environment specifically. Um, and we see that reflected in the sample. We also see that from an HR point of view, 71% of people are, are, are keeping people in their business in preparation for that. So there is at least some recognition at a, a, a kind of workforce or labour force level that there's a need to um, plan for growth rather than this just being a, a, you know, an aspirational um, uh, kind of hope that things are going to get better, as it were. What's quite important, though, is that one in three, um, so only one in three, uh, are, are very confident that they have um, the right people in place or the best people in place in the right places to drive growth. And that's how we actually defined a world-class workforce in the survey. So you have the best people in the right places to drive growth for your business. Um, that's not a global truth about what a world-class workforce might be. You may have your own definitions, but when we're talking about it in the context of this survey, that's, that, that's the, uh, the, the reference point that the respondents had. I think it's quite a good and, and, and sound um, you know, basis on which to, to, to get some, some feedback on that point. So why do we need a world-class workforce? Well, if you're going to deliver growth, you, 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 you need the right people to do that. I mean, it kind of goes without saying. I think the, the, the interesting thing about these, these three data points is that a lot of um, references to the best people is, is really about talent. And do you have the right talent and the right people in the right positions to, to generate growth? What we see from, from this is that 61% of the respondents are concerned about losing talent as we gear up to, for greatness if there is an uptick in the economy and we are generally going from a defensive position uh, from an HR or, or a kind of workforce perspective to, a, to, an, to an aggressive one. Um, we need to make sure we're keeping all the right people and, and the best people in the business. So there's a lot of concern about that, but um, only 33% of the respondents manage uh, what we call high potential employees. So have, um, you know, um, analytics systems in place to incentivize and manage their, their, their top performers. So there's something of a gap there. And perhaps mo the most, con most, most considered point here, which is that three quarters of the respondents think they could do more to manage talent. So if I were to step back and say that this is a sample of, of your peers, then three quarters of the people in this room probably think they could do better to, um, to improve talent management in their organization. So the, the, the two... The two key things here are there is um, a, you know, a, a guarded but evident level of optimism about the commercial environment as we go into, uh, as we go into 2014. Um, there is a connection between that, um, that, that, that positive sentiment and the need to have good people in, in the right positions in a business to drive growth, capitalise on that opportunity. Um, there is a concern, obviously, about um, that position, that status that you have in your organisation, have we got the right people in the right, in, in the right job doing the right things? And that perhaps we are, we are you know, expressing concerns and a little bit, shall we say, systemically weak in having uh, um, uh, the, the appropriate kind of protocol, strategies, or however you want to couch it, in place to make that happen as a business. So the top three challenges, this starts to um, cement some of this. There's some data points in the executive summary about, um, about these, these, these issues in a little more detail. Top three challenges for, for HR, attraction, retention, and systems. They're all kind of linked, aren't they? You know, attraction and retention are pretty much two halves of the same coin, um, two, si two sides of the same coin. But really, what we talked about a lot this morning, and I think it'll, we'll come back to it more and more, is, is, is systems. The, has, as, a, as an HR uh, function in a business, most of the time, you're in a situation where you're trying to um, create the framework by which your company can optimally operate from a, from a workforce perspective. Um, you're not in a position with, you know, probably multiple thousands of people in an organization where you can go around to each desk and, and see how everyone's doing. You're there to set the structure up. And structures and frameworks are, are based on systems. And increasingly, uh, you know, as, as we... As, as, as we race through this, this decade, those systems are becoming more sophisticated. They're promising a lot more. The guys from Deloitte um, you know, put a lot of promises into the systems that they were talking about and the, the offers that the, um, and solutions they had for organizations. So they promise a lot more, but they're also more complex to understand. So getting systems right is a way that, as a decision-making or, or, or central business function or team uh, in HR, that is, you can address these other two issues. 
So if we take that as a, um, we know what the challenges are, retention, attraction, the systems that underpin it, um, and we know that um, there's an appetite for growth, uh, but we might not be in the best shape possible to capitalize upon that. We can start to look at these three areas, data, and part data partnership, and, and technologies with some specific um, data points around that. So I'll start each section with a, with a, with a statement, really, a, a kind of rhetorical point. The one here is that HR struggles to cross the chasm of data, value, insights, and analysis, and why is that? I think this morning you had a lot of um, conversation about analysis and evidence being very important. Okay? Interestingly, some of the questions that came back um, from those presentations was really about why. So I think intellectually everyone understands that there is a kind of systemic analytical utopia that sits out there where at the press of a button I can answer questions. But actually achieving that is a very, very complicated thing. And most companies most of the time fall short in that regard. So why is that? Just to have a look at a, a kind of distribution curve of sophistication, if you like. 79% um, of the respondents said they could do more to get value from HR data. Um, and when we look at those that have, um, actually the Deloitte presentation earlier had a similar number, so it's quite gratifying that's the case. Um, I think they said around 15% of people from a, a, a large-scale survey they'd done had some sort of sophisticated analytics in their business. What we see here is 9% of our respondents use predictive analytics in, in, in their, in their organisations, and 5% um, believe they make best use of HR to, uh, data to manage risk. So what we know is that only a minority of businesses are operating in a very sophisticated way. Let's be practical about that. What should we do about that? And what, one thing I can tell you as a researcher, and having done this for a lot of years, is that number, if we repeat it in, in five years' time, probably won't change. What happens is that the game's always moving on. We have an adoption curve, don't we? We have early adopters of technology, and we have um, a, a distribution of adoption beyond that, all the way back to laggards, who are way behind, um, you know, way behind the rest. So what we know is there's, there's always companies that are on the front foot and are kind of advancing in terms of te technology adoption. Um, but there's a huge appetite with everyone behind them to, to try and close the gap. Just as a straw poll in the audience, who would put themselves as an organisation in that, let's say, the top 15% who is on the front foot um, in, in, in the sophisticated adoption of IT? One. Is this, are you guys all from Capita? It says Capita on there. You're not? Okay, right, because I thought, well, Capita, obviously, you'd have like really sophisticated systems. Okay, so, so there we see the, the challenge and, and, and the discussion that we need to have. I'd also like um, a show of hands and perhaps to pose a question, which is, are you currently in your business, and this is a great time to ask this question as we go towards the end of the year, are you currently in a situation where you have a um, a, a strategy or a task force or a plan that points towards getting more from the information, the HR information you have in your organisation. So who is in a situation where that's happening right now, where there is a focus on trying to gather more, more value from the data in your business? Okay, that's about, I'd say that's about half, maybe over half. Would anyone mind just um, giving us a real quick example of what that is? Um, so without disclosing interests or, 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 or details, what type of work that would be? Anyone brave enough to let us know? There's a gentleman over here, sorry, thanks, Faye. I think there might just need to be a... So, um, there you go. today we have very uh, with disparate systems, legacy systems from different parts of our organisation that don't talk to each other. So, there's a big uh, focus sponsored by the CEO in the UK too, uh, with some investment from some BI uh, experts, which is good, um, to help us within HR to pull all that data together. And uh, first of all, I think in terms of the levels we talked about earlier today, understanding what data we've got um, at, our, at our fingertips and what the gaps are, uh, and the panacea absolutely is to get to the predictive analytics or analysis say, stage as we go into next year. So um, it's becoming increasing impo increasingly important to us within our organisation in the UK uh, and, and I today. Okay, great. Thanks. That, thanks very much. That's a very succinct and, um, and very appropriate uh, example. Anybody else? Or does that make, is that similar to other people in the room? Are we talking about silos of information? 
held in different places, trying to gather those together. The challenge is with the workforce, they just generate so much information, you know, just by being a workforce, there's bits of data coming out of your ears from the get-go. Really interesting, the very first, um, some of the very kind of early um, analytics that were available were driven from um, kind of um, payroll data. So if we go back to, you know, go back 30 years even, one of the things that you could analyze a business by was payroll data because it was triggered at the same time every, every month. It moved as a result of things that you did and you understood that. And you know, if it went down and your, and, your, and your performance went up, that was great. And if it went up and your performance went down, that was awful. Um, but principally, there's a, there's, a kind of, there's, there's a very interesting legacy of analytics and data within HR. But actually, over recent years, it's almost as if you know, we've been swamped by the potential. I think that's an important thing, swamped by the potential that is promised with, with analytics and, and, and how we can make decisions better as a result. So uh, to the gentleman's point earlier, what we see from the data that, uh, and from the sample, only 53% or 53% of respondents are only able to plan resourcing needs um, up to six months in advance. So a lot of businesses don't have the ability to, um, to plan their workforce needs beyond a six-month window, which has obvious and evident kind of limitations for most organisations, especially if we're talking about large-scale workforces. What you see from the, the bar graph there, and, and, and to your point is, so what are, the, what are the challenges here? Why can't we be better at doing this? Um, they're very familiar points. Um, specifically, data located in different systems is, is, is the third point there. So it speaks exactly to the example that was given. Um, lack of time and, and, and lack of system, so lack of applications and technology to, to analyze that data. So we see that as a conundrum um, and, and one that we have to wrestle with. Of course, uh, when we go on to these, the, the question we can pose here is if we go into these other areas, we go into partnerships and we go into technology, how can those things help? How can they solve that problem, close that gap? So let's look at, let's take a little look at partnerships. How, how do you balance, when we look at partnerships, we're going to look at some specific things. How do you balance the need for cost savings with the desire for innovation in partnerships? If I were to give you um, an example, um, we recently did a piece of work specifically for the manufacturing sector, which without going into too much detail, concluded that when a sector is under pressure, and we can use a sector as a proxy for a um, for a business function, so it's just a horizontal or vertical view of, of, of a, a group of, you know, of, of people who have of shared interests and behaviours, if you like. But when that sector's under pressure, the need to partner, the need to collaborate, the need to stick your head above the parapet of, 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 of your organisation and connect with other people goes up. Okay, so just like when we're in trouble as human beings, it seems that organisations, in a slightly more abstract sense, do a similar thing. When they're in trouble, they ask for help. And we do that through partnerships. We do that through, um, we do that through outsourcing. We do that through, through, through lots of devices that include third parties into our business. So why do you use HR service providers? In our survey, most companies use four to five key HR service providers in their businesses. Okay, that might be about the same for everyone in the audience. But it might be slightly different. But we know that there are four or five organizations that you select as third party um, partners, um, we could say suppliers if we're being less generous, um, to help you do your work. It seems to be that the overwhelming majority of us do that because we're looking for innovation. We're looking for answers to questions that we can't solve in our own business. Would that make sense? Would you say that in, in, in supplier, let's take an example like learning and, learning and development, very common uh, HR service provision. So in that regard, are you looking for that provider to provide or deliver innovation to your business? Maybe that they're innovative, maybe that, um, that you're looking for them to deliver on something that you consider to be innovative, but innovation is a driver for why we utilize third parties in, in, uh, for our organization. Does that, does that make sense, that, that, that distribution? Yeah, there's some nods around the room. Okay, so here's the problem. What do you look for in HR service providers? It's cost savings. So there's something of a contradiction there, isn't there? We, we, we have a, it's, it's sort of the commercial head ruling the commercial heart. We want to use third parties to share and collaborate and innovate, but actually we select third parties on, on, on the basis of costs. Um, who tends to select third parties here based on what is predominantly a cost evaluation rather than an innovation scorecard? Who would, would, that be, would that be about right? Do, is it a cost-driven cost driven, um, starting point for selecting those third, third parties? It's a problem, isn't it? It's a bit like um, 
you know, do you marry for personality or do you marry for money? You know, which one do you do? Um, I won't tell you which one I did. Uh, but, but nevertheless, this is a challenge. So, w and what we're really talking about here is not, not, a, not a duplicity. So it's not that the same group of people you know, wake up on Monday morning with the need to innovate and go to bed on Friday afternoon or Friday evening um, obsessed with cost saving. The issue is this, this tension between what you aspire to do professionally and what you know is a long-term view for the, for the organisation and what that organisation is demanding from you. And most of the time, organisations demand cost saving. It's a really big challenge. So I think it's actually a big, big challenge with HR. You know, the... What all boards understand about HR is that if you have 1,000 people doing um, some work and you can get 900 people to do that same work, that takes 100 people out of your business and that has an immediate impact on the bottom line and CEOs get that. Okay? It's not a complex equation. You don't need sophisticated analytics to prove it, but if you can do more with less, and that's headcount, everyone around the, the boardroom table will nod along. If you want to try and build a business case for why you might need 1,100 people rather than 1,000 people to achieve goals aligned with growth, or even just with keeping up with the competition, you have an array of questions and business cases and challenges that you have to address. And in that sits this problem, sits this problem of, of cost saving and innovation. Is it the case that, would, would that connect with anyone in the room? So is it the case that in the last, let's say, 12 to 24 months, you have had some kind of conflict in your organisation between the need to innovate and the need to save money as, a, as an HR function. W would that be the case? Can we have a show of hands on that? Is that, is that the case? Okay. No. <laughs> I'd say is the answer, but a gentleman raised his hand there, and I think, thank you for that. So it's also very interesting, when we get to what people are looking to innovate, uh, are looking to outsource, 67% of, of the respondents plan to outsource more HR services in the next 12 months. So we know that outsourcing is a, is a bug that, you know, is, um, that, that has been caught and is very, very um, commonplace in large organisations and is only set to increase. Driven by our third pillar of, of, of conversation, which we'll come to in a second, you know, by, in, in some regard by technology. What's interesting is when you look at what they're looking to outsource, so looking to get, or, or looking to get third party provision to support HR strategy, learning and development. Those are things where if we're looking at HR best practice, the last thing you really want to be doing is sacrificing innovation in the name of cost saving. Now, these are very, very important things. It's not um, simple systems based functionality. This isn't outsourcing payrolls or, or, or large processes. This is, this is strategic stuff. It's complicated stuff too. So there, there's another challenge, a trend that we see in outsourcing, the, the trend that we see in people wanting to get third parties to work with them with their organisations, um, is somewhat at, at odds with the reason why we, we tend to select suppliers. So how can technology support HR in achieving organisational goals? Can I have a show of hands as to who has a really good relationship at a department level with their IT function? Okay. Who has a relationship that could be improved upon? Which is the research way of saying not a great one. <laughs> um, okay, so IT. God, it's so great, isn't it, IT? But it's also so frustrating. Um, we just have a quick look at, at, at technology and, and some of the trends that are uh, that, that your peers are, are identifying um, as, as priorities for them and, and challenges over the next kind of 12 months. It's worth noting, we actually do, so my organisation looks a lot at how technology um, uh, affects business functions. A um, couple of statistics for you, um, because a lot of things that um, you will be engaged with that uh, require HR input, such as the gentleman's example over there, are, are essentially defined as projects. You know, they're large, scale, tend to be fairly large scale, IT projects where there is a business unit group and an IT group that are trying to deliver on that. Some interesting numbers for you. So 56% of IT decisions are made uh, by a committee of people, not solely the domain of technology. So it's made by committee with business unit, business function, people involved in that decision making process. Gartner, who are a, um, who are a, a very large um, um, IT analyst company, predict that by 2020, 80% of IT budgets will sit outside of the IT department. 80% of IT budgets will sit outside of the IT department. Um, now, if you're a room full of IT people, that would definitely create some conversation because, for obvious reasons, they are the skilled professionals that deliver IT into our organisations. Um, 
and create the strategy. But what's happening is the worlds of business and the worlds of technology are colliding, um, and that creates that, that challenge. Here's another couple of numbers for you. 86% of IT projects overrun. Okay. In a recent survey we did of, of organizations specifically dealing with the type of example the gentleman gave, so a data integration essentially projects, 53% of projects took so long to deliver they were superseded by the business need. So they actually became outdated as projects. And therefore, the need for business people, in this case HR professionals, to understand technology, to speak in a, in a not in a bits and bytes fashion, but to speak in a way that makes sense to the technology function and to work collaboratively to achieve goals is, is, is really, really important because so often in the, it's the case that it's the, it's the sticking point um, to, to delivering on a commercial or a corporate initiative. So what we know is that 58% of the samples intend to spend more on technology in the next 12 months. So IT budgets go up. They tend to go up you know, um, fairly steadily year on year. You look at most of the people who are in the you know, Forbes billionaire list, there's a disproportionate representation of companies, uh, individuals who've started software companies. So it's definitely a good game to get into. Um, can I ask if anyone here has had any um, discussion, planning, consideration, group level conversation around social media in their organizations in the last 12 months. Has social media come up as, 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 as an organizational issue in any way? Yeah. Normally it's about, um, from an HR point of view, it can actually be from a recruitment point of view. It can be a, be a great way to bring people into the business. It can be from an internal comms point of view, a great way to, to share information. Um, but actually, and often, it's also about risk management. So now all of a sudden your employees have the capacity to say whatever they want to whomever they want, whenever they want. And um, that's quite a scary thought for most boardrooms. You know? Some com that, top, that, that upper, you know, upper right early adopter, 10% will have a very liberated view of this. Um, but the rest of us are grappling with how you balance those points. Um, but interestingly, so um, very similar to the, to, the, um, to the outsourcing question, so 59, 60%, so just under two thirds of respondents are making this investment in, in, in terms of innovation, so that their driver is innovation. They see, we see technology as a way of innovating in our businesses. Some of the things that people are doing, so 88% of, of respondents um, uh, say they have um, cloud capabilities to some degree. Does everyone um, in the room have a broad uh, understanding of what cloud IT is, cloud services? Does that mean something to everyone? Would anyone like to offer a definition? <laughs> no, okay. But isn't it interesting? So five years ago, if I'd have done this same presentation to a room full of IT people, you would have had, you would have had maybe half the room not wanting to you know, acknowledge that they maybe knew what it was in detail. And now we have a, you know, a room full of, 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 of HR and, and, and kind of operational professionals who, are, um, who um, have an understanding of what this, this is as a phenomenon. It's a great idea. It allows you to get loads of capital expenditure out of your business. Um, empowers the business unit, so puts less pressure on having you know, lots and lots of um, in-house siloed pieces of technology and maybe allowing third parties to take care of some of the challenges that you have. So it's a brilliant way forward. Um, comes with concerns as well. 71% um, believe it's a model that can address HR challenges. And I think if we think about some of those HR challenges being um, the issue of, the, 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 the issue of um, and working alongside IT or, or speed. I think a gentleman in, in, the, in the session this morning talked about speed. How quickly can you affect things through um, operational processes, which is a, a proxy for technology. So it can speed things up too. So there's definitely a consensus there in this data. Um, but 55% are concerned about the control for HR with wider cloud adoption. So how do you, how do you keep control over something when it's outside your organization? What you'll know now is that generally, if um, I mean, who has in some to some degree cloud, uh, you know, something operating on a cloud model in their business right now from an IT perspective? Okay, so about maybe 30, 30 percent or so. T very, very typical. Um, more and more of you will inevitably, um, you know, come into that, come into that, uh, th that kind of cloud environment. One of the key things about it is when something goes wrong for the people who um, 
in the room who aren't necessarily using that model. If something goes wrong now with your IT, you know the department to call, you know the people to pick up the phone to to fix it. Um, if you need to, uh, help with planning and support and assistance, even if it's from a strategic level with IT, you know who the people are to go to. The more you distribute that ownership and that control out to third parties, the, the more you have to re you know, relinquish some of that comfort, but for all the benefits that we, that, that we mentioned earlier. So, um, in summary, um, on these points, what we see really is that there, there is a, um, um, an interdependence between these, these three areas, okay? Um, technology alone is not going to solve your, 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 your business problems, but we know that technology is a huge enabler of, um, of, of, of dealing with that challenge, of, of, of answering questions, of creating efficiency, of improving performance. Um, increasingly, we're looking at organizations outside of our businesses to help us to support that um, so so partnerships and also that we, we as we as um, as professionals are very very focused and, and especially in this track in this room and, and some of the conversation this morning we're very very focused on data what data can deliver for us okay if we go back to the social media example Social media now creates a, a load of opportunities for us to understand our workforce in different ways. It does that because of data. It's another slice of data we can add into the, I think the term used this morning was hopper, to, to, to create more understanding. Um, it's interesting that though, isn't it? Because um, who thinks here that social media can answer some of the problems that they've got within the business? Okay, who thinks that social media has, has no relationship to the, the, the issues they're dealing with in their organisation right now? So would I imagine that between the, the, the people that put their hands up at the start and everyone else, everyone else is, you know, not convinced either way, can't necessarily see the value, know it's important, my kids definitely use it, um, I use it now and again, I have been known to tweet, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, nevertheless, it's that. The interesting thing about it is it's a technology-driven phenomenon, isn't it? So who five years ago had a problem with Twitter? I definitely didn't. I don't think any of you guys did. Facebook wasn't a problem. You know, I didn't spend hours with my wife watching the telly and also playing on Facebook of an evening. We just used to watch the telly. Um, but it, it's, a, it's a technology issue, a technology challenge driven by the advancement of technology, isn't it? And that's one of the conundrums I think we face with, 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 with the data um, challenge overall as HR professionals is that Sometimes we're sport for the information that we can try and capture, utilise and, and, and make use of. A lot of that information is driven by an advancement in technology itself, you know. Um, and you do have to separate, and I think there's some really good points this morning about uh, evidence-based um, decision-making. You do have to separate the beautiful dashboard, this wonderful description of your organisation that is possible with, it, with, you know, the appropriate information, infrastructure and analytics. You have to separate that from the, the business need that it's addressing. But our overall contention here is that... Um, is that these three, the, these three issues, these three areas are very much interdependent and it's very, very hard to, to decouple any one of them without considering the other. I think that's the most important, important consideration. And really what we're talking about then is, is, is three simple points. It's, uh, because if we take this up into a kind of real-world scenario, okay, so a business-level discussion, we're really talking about um, commitments and priorities and, and connections. You know? So the... the the commitment, so what is your organisation committed to at a, at, a, at a strategic level to, to affect, to change from an HR perspective? Any directive that comes into the HR function is automatically, once it, whilst it might be a very simple you know, directive, initiative, strategy at the, uh, at the starting point, you might have one simple question we're trying to answer, it very quickly becomes an array of considerations, an array of cause and effect that you're trying to understand. And that's where priority comes in. Okay, we have to have a kind of structured and sensible ways of prioritizing what we're trying to affect and change um, uh, in order to make headway there. Otherwise, we, we can get into situations where the, the wood, you know, isn't seen through the trees very quickly. And, and more and more, as a result of some, some you know, some technology enablers, but also a, 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 a macro industry, industrial shift to, to outsourcing and third party partnerships, we're looking at those connections, those connections with other businesses to help us make, make a change. So if we, have those, if we have these building blocks in place, if we have the appropriate building blocks in place here, they should be an, 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 an effective foundation to deal with. The strategic challenges that are, are outlined in, in, in the report and, and, and obviously um, we can discuss as, as we go through. Um, 
There is a, the, the report itself, above and beyond the document you have there, is available um, via the website, um, uh, via the website for the event today. So you can, um, you can, I believe, they click on a link to get to that, can't you, from the from the from the website? Is that correct? Yeah. Okay, so, um, uh, and, and, and as I say, the, the point of this is to open up some discussion. So I would like to just uh, offer up some, some questions that perhaps we can um, Q&A between us in the last kind of 10, 15 minutes that we have. The first one is this. Of the information that you've heard um, just in the last 20 minutes, what piece of information would you most likely take back to your, um, to your work group, to your, to your, your peers, and share? What piece of information do you think um, either resonated most with you from a, uh, an organisation point of view, or is something you might use um, to uh, help tell a story, build a business case, start a discussion with, you, with your business? So if anyone can remember any of the data, but is it around data? Let's keep it simple. Is it around data? Is it around partnerships? Is it around technology? What information stood out to you of the, of the things that we listened to? Any, anybody at all? Anybody have specific, um, specific issues right now? Oh, sorry. I think you, you had a slide up uh, around why you don't do something, and 42% said they didn't have time, which is like, you know, which was probably caused by the fact that they didn't have the systems or the joined up in infrastructure to do it in the first place. So it was a bit of a conundrum. Mm. I was interested in that because uh, that's quite often what you see. You know, they, the executives get a dashboard and they think, hey, everything's fine, but there's an army of people underneath trying to get the data and it's that you know people get frustrated because it takes them so long who here has enough time to do what they need to do in their job right now who here would like some more time to do what they need to do in their job show of hands who would like some more time and here you are on a day out listening to us <laughs> talk about things to do with your industry no, that's a, that's a flippant and, and, and should be disregarded remark. Um, yeah, time's really important, isn't it? Um, we did a study um, quite recently about, we asked a really nice question, which was if you had an extra day in your week, in your working week, to achieve the goals that you are, you are trying to achieve as an organisation or as a, as a professional, what would you do with that day? Okay, so just imagine that in some mythical um, quantum leap, you get an extra day that is not the weekend and it isn't the days that we know. Think about it yourselves for a second. How would you invest that time? And you can't just go, go play golf or, you know, spend some more time with the kids. This has got to be about helping achieve commercial goals. So, just speculatively, what, if anyone wants to, what do you think most people said? What do you think would be a, a, an answer? If I had an extra day in the week, I would... Here's what. Who thinks that most people, and this is the surprising point, so I'll perhaps give you the answer, that most people would just do what they do now, but have an extra day to do it? Right, so the overwhelming majority of respondents, if, when, when given the option of, I would do what I'm doing now, I would do what I do in my five-day week, I'd just have an extra day. So I just have more time, okay? No one says that. Altruistically, and it's very interesting, what a lot of people do, do, do look at is um, helping others, helping others in their business to achieve their goals. So this is a business function kind of group of people, so I need to connect with other people in my business. Um, hardly anybody would invest in their own personal development and skills, but they might invest in something that helps the efficiency of their team. So... Maybe they were all so dizzy from the fact that they had an extra day in the week, we all get altruistic all of a sudden on a questionnaire. But then this is quite interesting as to, to what we do. The, the big point being that what we would do to, to affect um, um, what, what this point speaks to is that um, it's about how we work and what we're doing that, is the, it, that absorbs our time rather than necessarily the absolute hours in the day that we have to do it. You know, there's a nasty rumour goes around that the nine to five is, is over and that we spend a lot of time working outside of those parameters. So already we're stretching the time frame. But it's the models, isn't it? The models that we use, or the, the, sorry, the, 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 the frameworks within which we work often burn time. Um, one of the key things there, I think, is um, 
is actually speaks to one of these points, which is partnership. Um, you can, it, it's quite easy to create an equation where working with third parties saves internal time. Um, you may have gone through example, uh, may have gone through experiences in your own businesses where you've outsourced even parts of your HR function on the basis that it saves time internally, maybe to, you know, uh, to, to downsize the team, maybe to just refocus their energies a little bit. But it's, a, it, it's often a false promise that, you know, th those partnerships require management, despite the SLAs you might be given, despite the, the, the assurances you might have. They, they, they require investment themselves, and often the way that we calibrate the, the benefit of, of working with, our, with third parties, which creates pressure on those third parties as well, is that simply by taking the problem or taking that resource burden and putting it elsewhere, we can, we can create some time. But definitely, to your, to your point, there is some interdependence between we burn up a lot of time because the systems that we have in place aren't optimised to help us. And that might be a process. It might not be an application or a technology issue. It could just be a system overall. Anything else from the, from the, from, from the data? So a piece of information that you might take back to the workplace and go, I heard this survey today, and it was interesting that. Sorry, Faye. So, so um, I missed the Deloitte session earlier, but I was intrigued by the 9% using analytics to manage risk and mm. generate opportunity. We do it in our business. We don't do enough of it. I'm just, I don't, why? why? Why is that number so low? Mm. It's, it's hard, isn't it, an analyzing risk? I mean, so what is your, could you just describe your organization to us, sir? Sorry. The, um, the, well, the so I work for um, uh, one of the big accounting firms, EY, but I have two hats. So one is... Yeah, I'm a management consultant. I run part of their HR consulting business. But also, um, I'm doing a project internally to get us to use analytics better. Right. So i am you know, got an internal HR hat on as well. What you tend to find, um, I think, with, and the reason why that number is, you know, perhaps concerningly low if we're, if we're pointing the mirror of best practice at the data, um, is that... Information-centric businesses are pretty good at having information, you know, and analytical-centric um, views of their of their organisation. When you move away from that, and bear in mind that you know, even in the UK economy, which has a huge amount of you know service-based finance and business service-orientated organisations, but when you move away from that, it can fall apart pretty quickly. Largely because you're dealing with, in general, a more complex view of what you're trying to understand. You know, as soon as you have um, uh, a supply chain involved or, you know, a set of, a set of shops if it's a retail, um, a, a chain of shops from a retail perspective, if you have, um, you know, logistics requirements and different, many different flavours of employees in your organisation as a manufacturing business may have, then the, 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 the and it speaks to the, sorry, you weren't in the, the, the presentation earlier, but it speaks to the issue that Deloitte raised, which was you can, it, it's how, how wide you cast your net in order to analyse information. The more complex the business, the harder that is to do. Um, but it should be higher, of course, it should be higher. Um, is anyone, so does that connect with anyone here? So is anyone here, I think we said people are looking to get more from their HR data. So do people think they're going to be in a better position in 12 months' time to understand their business than they are today as a result of the work they're doing or, or as, as the, you know, the developments they're making in these areas? Is, is, is analytics is, is, and, and um, um, risk analysis and management a priority for folks? Is that something that's coming up? Yeah, some nods around the table. Okay. Um, any other questions? Any other, any other pieces of information that, that stick out? We've had time. Um, we need more time. Um, and uh, I, I've given you the luxury of thinking about what an extra day in the week might look like as a thought experiment, unfortunately, not as a um, bonus for coming to the event. Um, and we've looked at analytics and why that's so low. Um, other thing, just to go back to the point you made there, is there's always going to be things you can analyse. There's always going to be data you can capture. Um, and so it's a... It's a kind of, you know, continual work in process. I think the issue is getting the, getting the agenda point of analysis and information tabled at a kind of decision-making level in the business is often the first, you know, objection or, 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 or challenge one needs to overcome to get that ball rolling in a business. So any other points? Any points on technology, partnerships? Billy, I'll, I'll ask a question. Um, in the research, it came out with innovation, um, that that's what the clients want and then they're also very reliant on them needing to be cost efficient and hence cost savings are important. Has anyone got any instances where they've struck a balance where you can get innovation and cost saving together? That's a good question. Uh, I was interested in the, the statistic. It almost sounded like 
um, they were they were um, were mutually exclusive. So in other words, you couldn't make savings and innovate. And I think most organisations that I'm familiar with would expect to do both. Hmm. You got to save, and you've got to innovate. And I think uh, I'll plug my. I'm doing a session after lunch around some of the technology uh, implementations that we did, and we'll we'll save money. And I think we've got a much much better solution, more innovative than than we had previously. So yeah, I think hmm. absolutely you can. And you I can think most organisations are right to expect that. HR should be driving cost and innovating at the same time. Why I think not? I, I, it's a good point, and they, they, they shouldn't be seen as, as, as mutually exclusive, um, perhaps a little divisive in how we share that information. But the, um, one of the challenges, of course, is a cost saving is really easy to define. It's when something that you used to pay a certain amount for or that used to cost you something costs less. Okay? That's the universal concept of cost saving. Who would like to give me a definition of innovation? It's a slightly different ball game, isn't it? Um, innovation can be rhetorical, can be just that we are an innovative business and that ergo we innovate. It can be very explicit. So, you know, there are lots of ways that um, just turning the lens to government funding, um, you know, you can, you can apply for uh, and get tax relief or, 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 or um, you know, support with growth, especially at an SMB level, if you demonstrate you're innovative um, as an organisation. For example, if you have an R&D function in your organisation, that's very explicit innovation, isn't it? But I think one of the challenges is that they're, 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 one's easy to understand, one's not. They're definitely not mutually exclusive, of course. There is always some reconciliation that goes on, I think, you know. And sometimes, and I'm sure people here would have had a, a partnership arrangement or an outsourcing, you know, you'd have gone to a supplier. And the overriding um, issue is that you just need to save some money or you just need to get that, that piece of work out of the business. It's not that necessarily you need you know, you need seismic change in how you're operating. It's just a very practical thing. But once you're outside of that, and particularly to the points on that slide, which are about what we're innovating in it, HR strategy and learning and development. So those are the, th sorry, those are the, thing those are the focuses for people in their increased investment in outsourced investment. Then, um, of course, the, the innovation should be prioritised because if it's simply a case of just trying to bootstrap your business, you're, you're sort of looking in the wrong places for that, for that um, you know, for that return, essentially. Okay, what do you think, um, so my final question on this, so I asked you the question of what piece of information you'd take back and share with your colleagues and your, um, your peers from, from the data. If you could take one piece of data back to your chief executive tomorrow, um, in the lift as you go to work, if you are in a situation where you get in a lift with your chief executive, if not, not to worry, let's just use it as an example. What, what piece of information would you take back to them? What's the biggest obstacle you're trying to, are you, and I'll, I'll set the context of the question, what's the biggest obstacle you're trying to convince the business of in terms of change right now? What's the challenge? And where do you think that a piece of information to your chief exec might help that? Is it around, so is, is it around understanding the business? Is it that the challenge for HR is we, we don't have enough information on which to make decisions? Is it that we, um, we um, need to be better prepared for growth? Is that something that will connect with people that we don't feel that we're um, in a position to capitalize on the opportunity that's in front of us? In fact, that's a good question to pose. So the first slide was about growth, was about um, gearing up for a world-class workforce and um, I won't show you the number, but it's in the data, but you, maybe you remember it. So do you think right now, a show of hands, do you think that you have the majority of people in your business are the best people in the right place for you to realise growth as an organisation? Do you think that's currently the case in your organisation? If, if you think that's the case, that the majority of people are the, right, the best people in the right places to deliver growth for your business, if you think that's the case, then maybe a, a show of hands. Who thinks that's the case right now with their business? Okay, and who thinks they've got room for improvement on, on, in that regard? So very, um, very reflective of the, of, of the sample overall, I think. Maybe that's, uh, maybe that's the piece of data that you should print off from the report and when you're in the lift tomorrow, have it strapped to your shirt or something. Because this is objective data, it's not your view, you're just sharing the view of your peers to the people in your organisation, of course. 
Um, okay, thank you. Um, on that note, I think um, unless there are any other questions specifically about the information, is there anything in particular from, from the from data itself? Good. Well, we are. You, our, our contact details are uh, within the report. So, if there's anything you want any more information, we're happy to help there. But on that note, uh, thank you for your time. It was a, a pleasure speaking to you, and I hope you found it useful. And um, yeah, thanks very much. <laughs>